The year was 1994, and all seemed well at Site-19. Researchers, administrative staff, containment specialists, and guards saw to their daily tasks. As the largest SCP Foundation containment site on the books, there was something paradoxically prestigious and pedestrian about working at the legendary facility. Of course, among staff at the SCP Foundation, the site was famous and took on a certain mythology around breakroom discussions for those who weren't assigned there. Did you see the crazy new tech they got at Site-19? <laughs> it's like something out of Star Wars. I heard some of the anomalies they store at Site-19 can cause XK class end of the world scenarios, so they've got hammer down on speed dial. You know, my buddy told me that Site-19 has a pool on the fifth floor. Everyone who works there gets to go up and chill there once a week, and they've got a dedicated bar up there that serves cocktails with little umbrellas all night long. Of course, some rumors are truer than others. Not the pool thing, though. Sorry, that one's complete baloney. It is, however, completely true of the SCP Explained office, but hey, that's a story for another day. Site-19, as a result of its size, does indeed need a simultaneously large and elite staff to handle its many unique containment requirements. People work around the clock to ensure everything runs smoothly, knowing that the risk of dropping the ball means death and destruction on a wide scale. Personnel have been trained to meticulously study new anomalies, discover their strengths and weaknesses, drum up ideal containment requirements, and get the situation on lock as quickly as possible. Most of the time, the operations at Site-19 run smoother than George Benson. Most of the time. Of course, with the exception of a few researchers there. Sorry, Dr. Bright and Dr. Crow. Everyone who works at Site-19 is only human. Mistakes can happen, even when the cost of those mistakes is much costlier than when you forget to carry the little zero on your dull office job's latest mind-numbing spreadsheet. Little oversights can pile up into catastrophes over time, especially when you put your mind to committing the greatest sin of all, underestimating your opponent, exactly as the SCP Foundation did one fateful day in 1994. You see, the SCP Foundation contains hundreds, if not thousands, of new anomalies every single year. When this job becomes your daily bread and butter, what once seemed exceptionally slow becomes humdrum and mundane. Just like the earlier rumors suggested, there are monsters, entities, and objects locked up at Site-19 that could cause an XK-class end-of-the-world scenario if they ever got out. Could the fine folks staffing that site really be blamed for not paying that much attention to some anomalous sculpture? They just weren't aware how incredibly dire the consequences of taking your eyes off of SCP-173 were yet. But believe me when I say, they were about to receive a hell of an education. The sculpture had come into their care a year earlier, in 1993. Though the exact circumstances of how it came to Site-19 tend to differ depending on who you ask. Its anomalous ability had become apparent rather quickly, at the expense of a few careless personnel's lives. But hey, isn't that always the way these things unfold? The sculpture could be frozen in place by looking at it, though whenever people turned their gaze away, it moved towards its prey at shocking speeds, and killed them by either strangulation or, more commonly, snapping necks. Sure, it wasn't the kind of entity you'd want to have a cup of coffee with or place in your living room as a striking new object dot, but the Foundation had plenty of these so-called murder monsters in containment already, and this was one you didn't even need to shoot. Just looking at it is enough to freeze it in place. A few D-classes were lost during the first few months of figuring out the best way to clean the nasty creature's cell, on account of the fact that it poops constantly. But other than that, it was all pretty smooth sailing. They had no idea just how dangerous this work of malicious modern art was. This brings us back to that fateful day in 1994. The day when SCP-173 first breached containment. Researcher Theo Trask was walking down the large winding halls of Site-19, marking off each successfully contained anomaly on his clipboard. It was a monotonous job, but somebody had to do it. He looked through the viewing windows of all the anomalies that wasn't deadly to look at, taking inventory. He worked at the SCP Foundation for eight years now, and nothing amazed him anymore. 
He was thinking about what he might have for dinner that night, or whether he should go to the movie theater to see that new film, Pulp Fiction. Up in the security office for Sector C of Site-19, security officer Todd Buffett and his men observed the monitors glowing before them. It was a blissfully boring day. One of them was discreetly playing Snake on his Nokia under the table. Days like this were made for wasting, and they were tragically few at the SCP Foundation, where being excited was often the prelude for being dead. Todd yawned and was happy for the privilege to do so. In a darkened Sector C server room, a group of engineers performed routine maintenance. They could see their breath. These rooms were kept extra cold to prevent the technology from overheating. It was intricate work, but they were well trained to do it. So much so that they sometimes slipped into a state of autopilot while conducting these checks, saving the burden of conscious thought for meteor tasks further down the line. These were unremarkable tasks on an unremarkable day and they would be happy for it all to end. And of course, it would, just not in the sense that they meant. A mixed group of researchers and administrative staff sat in the break room, enjoying their mediocre packed lunch and sharing their own version of inane office banter. It was a nice step away from the often deadly grind and shoot the breeze with others in their line of work. After all, it was a strange job with its own unique pressures. You needed to discuss it with others who got it sometimes, just to avoid going insane from the pressure. But then you needed to avoid the unforgivable blade of this double-edged sword's mirror half. You never wanted to get too attached to a co-worker at the SCP Foundation, because who knows, you might not be seeing them again tomorrow. Or they might not be seeing you. Back in the server bank, a junior technician named Colin Muntz was about to make one teeny tiny little mistake. While running diagnostics on one of the room's power cores, he tripped a fuse and set a terrible chain reaction in motion. Cables running all through Site-19 caught the shockwaves of Colin's poor decision in a moment, causing a series of power cuts that ran through different systems throughout the facility, each one tripping the next like proverbial series of tumbling dominoes. Back to researcher Theo Trask, lazily ticking boxes on his clipboard. He was about to do another one and break for lunch when the lights overhead suddenly went out, leaving him in a dark hallway. He was immediately broken from his trance, heart beating 20 to the dozen. Seconds passed, and the dark somehow remained. What was going on here? It didn't make sense. Surely the auxiliary generator should have kicked in by now, right? And on any other day, it would have. But unluckily for Theo Trask, this just so happened to be the one day in the last several months that the facility's main backup generator was also experiencing routine maintenance. Sometimes, life just isn't fair. Trask felt his heart leap up into his throat as a door somewhere behind him slowly creaked, open with a torturously long metallic screech. Trask didn't have a gun or even a taser, but he did have a small flashlight attached to his belt. With a draw speed that would rival Clint Eastwood in this prime, the terrified Trask whipped out his flashlight and shone it in the direction of the noise. His beam caught a static figure staring at him without a face. The rigid soulless body of the sculpture, SCP-173 was standing less than 10 feet away from him. In this light, its smears of Krylon based spray paint looked almost like a mocking grin. Your move, researcher, it seemed to say. Trask had broken into a cold sweat. His hand was shaking, but he needed to keep the beam on that monster. Whatever tripped the power must have compromised the system that governed the sculpture's electrical deadbolt. And unless the light bulbs came back on and the hallway was suddenly flooded with other personnel and a forklift to get that miserable chunk of concrete back into its cell, then he was in real trouble. He couldn't run. It would kill him the second he turned around. And he couldn't walk backwards. One trip in the dark and he'd be found dead on the ground, head facing in the wrong direction. All he could do now was hope. Hope, and of course, not blink. But as the seconds passed and the pressure mounted, this became harder and harder to achieve. He could feel the surface of his eyes drying out, leading to a sharp stinging sensation. Still, the sculpture lingered and waited as researcher Trask's eyes began to water. People should be coming, shouldn't they? Surely help would be on the way. But he couldn't hear footsteps or the squeaking tires of a forklift just yet. He couldn't hear anything except his heartbeat 
and the blood rushing in his ears. His eyes were killing him, just metaphorically for now, but not for long. What harm would one little blink do? Only for a fraction of a second. Now, before we proceed to the researcher's gruesome and terrifying death, we'd like to perform a quick experiment with you, the viewer of SCP Explained. We've created a number of videos exploring the fascinating and frightening enigma of SCP-173, and one statement seems to pop up in the comments again and again from backseat containment experts. Eh, why not just blink your eyes one at a time? That's a surefire way to keep it locked into place. Okay then, let's give it a try. Open both your eyes nice and wide. Now, blink your left eye. And now, blink your right. Left, right left, right. Keep going while I'm talking. Don't stop. Keep it up. How are your eyes feeling? It makes your vision a little blurry, doesn't it? Kind of makes your eyes sting a little as time goes on. Oh, look who it is. Well, if it isn't SCP-173. What a surprise. And it looks very interested in you, doesn't it? <sighs> Better keep one of your eyes open at all times. Left blink, right blink. Left blink, right blink. No pressure, of course. But if you've closed your eyes at any time during this little experiment, you're already laying dead on the ground with a broken neck. Left, right. Left, right. Do you feel the burn yet? There's no shame in giving up. All it'll cost you is your life. And that's why we don't blink one eye at a time. Now, back to the story. Researcher Trask couldn't take it any longer. His aching eyes fluttered closed for an almost imperceptible moment of time, and that was all this sinister sculpture needed. Trask felt the impossibly cold concrete grip of its stubby arms on either side of his head, and a sharp jerk that communicated a mere moment of unimaginable pain, followed by the physical answer to silence. The sculpture darted through the darkness of the hallway, with no living eyes left to freeze it in place. In the darkness, it was impossible to defeat, it would do the two things it knew how to do, hunt and murder. In the Sector C security office, all hell was breaking loose. Thanks to Colin Muntz's little oopsie in the server room, all the monitors were dark, and all the corded phones that had given them a direct line to assistance were all dead. They had no idea what was happening out there. Maybe they would all gotten extremely unlucky, and all of the cells were open. Whatever caused this catastrophic power failure must have also knocked out the alarm system, because they were getting nothing. When the door behind security officer Todd Buffett and his men opened, he was profoundly relieved to think that assistance had already arrived. He and his men were a lot less relieved when they began to fall to the ground. Their necks snapped with exquisite efficiency, if you're into that kind of thing. That's because the sculpture had found its way into the security office and gave itself more crunch than you'd get from a family-sized bag of Doritos. But with these new victims now little more than dead meat, it was time to move on. Over in the break room, the collection of research and administration staff who were enjoying pleasant chit-chat not long ago were now hidden away in darkness. It was so bleak in there that they couldn't see the cup of ramen steaming inches away from their faces. In moments like this, the usual advice is to stay calm and wait for the situation to be resolved. After all, if you tried to take anything into your own hands, you might fall over and injure yourself. Normally, this is good advice. It's less effective when the thing that wishes you grave injury is actively on its way, and sitting in the dark certainly isn't going to stop it. Elsewhere in the building, the engineering team were scrambling like there was no tomorrow to rectify their mistake. Partially because if SCP-173 got to them before they'd gotten the lights working again, there really would be no tomorrow. With their mini flashlights, they desperately searched for any way to rectify the issue and get everything turned back on. In a normal company, the biggest concern in a situation like this might be massive, irretrievable data loss. But of course, at the SCP Foundation, the issue is more a massive and irretrievable loss of human life, and also the data too. A few miles south of Site-19, a different kind of cavalry were on its way. A detachment of MTF Nu-7 Hammerdown were on their way in a pair of armored helicopters. Their assault rifles had flashlights fixed to them, and their helmets came fitted with night vision goggles as standard. Their intel suggested a large portion of Site-19 Sector C had gone dark for whatever reason, 
and they were ready to drop in and get things back under control. The one question was whether they'd get there in time to save the people in the break room as the sculpture drew ever closer to their location. Speaking of, the group of research and administration staff were still just sitting around, waiting for the lights to turn back on. One of the more senior researchers in the room, Dr. Sherry Brewis, was a lifelong smoker, and as such, she was fishing around in her purse for her Zippo lighter to shed some light on the situation. Her rummaging was so loud that she could barely even hear the door to the room beginning to creak open. But she heard the first snap, and the awful, animalistic chorus of screams that followed. Crunch, crunch, crunch. As each of her fellow members of Foundation personnel fell, she could feel the thing killing them getting closer. She could almost feel the same icy limbs gripping her skull when she whipped out and lit the Zippo, the flame coming alive in front of her face with the pleasing metallic click. It didn't offer much light, just enough for her to see the monster looming inches away from her face. SCP-173, limbs outstretched and ready. The rest of the room was silent. She knew in that moment she was the only one alive in here now, but she still wasn't the only survivor yet. That all depended on what happened next. The flame danced and the sculpture remained frozen in place, standing so close to her, it wanted her. It wanted to hear her neck crunch. The flames began to dance erratically, and Dr. Brewis felt her heart rate spike. One careless breath, and the light keeping her alive would be gone. But even if she did everything right here, it might not be enough to save her. It didn't even need a second to do what it wanted so badly to do. The light seemed almost to flicker, getting smaller, getting weaker. Dr. Brewis felt tears dribbling down her cheeks any second now. Click. The lights above her turned back on. She could have screamed in delirious relief, but that might have also been a scream at the expense of her many dead co-workers, littered around the room. Either way, her thoughts were interrupted by a staccato burst of footsteps, followed by the boom of the door being kicked in by a booted foot. The members of Hammerdown were standing in the doorway. She was saved. In the hours that followed, things were righted as best as they could be with so many deaths. The sculpture was returned to containment. The bodies were cleared away. The electrical issues were fixed. Much would continue on as normal after that day. Death, after all, was an occupational hazard for those working at the SCP Foundation. But one thing forever changed. SCP-173 was never underestimated again. Now go check out SCP-173 Origin Story, how SCP-173 got to Site-19 and the iPods, SCP-131, for more terrifying incidents involving this singularly savage statue.